God. And so for the rest of our time together, I simply want to unpack uh, these five solas. So first, what is sola gratia, or grace alone? Well, it is the emphasis that salvation or justification, most specifically, is by grace alone, meaning it is not merited. It is not deserved. And in Paul, this is explicit. He says in Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And notice that connection between grace and gift. And why is this so crucial? Why is a recovery of grace alone so crucial? Here's why. Because the scriptures are clear that no one is righteous. Romans 3. And therefore, no one in their own person is justified or is in the right before God. All who are born in Adam, according to the scriptures, according to Ephesians 2, are dead in sin. And that is a present reality, hardened, blind, rebellious, under the wrath of God by nature, children of wrath and haters of God, unwilling and unable to please him. This is what the reform came to call total depravity and total inability. And therefore, apart from grace and in regard to pure justice, every single human being born by natural generation in Adam, and there is no other way to be born, deserves nothing other than damnation, not salvation. And the whole world stands guilty before God because of this. Because of sin, under wrath, dead in sin. And therefore, salvation is not something that we ourselves can obtain. We cannot atone for it. We cannot acquire it. We cannot buy it. And even more, we don't want to, apart from the Spirit of God. Fallen men now under wrath and curse with hard hearts, and darkened minds are dead, as those cut off from communion with God, and thus we don't even desire him, even less his salvation. Therefore, if there's going to be any change in us, if there's going to be any salvation, if there's going to be any justification, if there's going to be any reconciliation between us and God, it must purely and ultimately be due to his desire to freely give to whomever he wills. And he doesn't give saving grace to all. Because of our dead status and corruption, God must give us of his own willing and grace, a new heart. He must give us a new spirit, and he must give us his spirit, Ezekiel 36, meaning God must regenerate, God must call effectually, God must declare righteous, God must sanctify and preserve to glory all a monergistic work, a work of one. Mono, one, ergistic like ergonomics, work. And all of this flows from his free grace, a free, unmerited, unearned gift alone. That's what the Reformed were trying to recover. Therefore, how can a man be right before God, counted as righteous and forgiven, justified? How can a man come back into fellowship with the triune God, knowing him, which is eternal life? John 17, 3. The answer is grace. Free grace. And that's it. But how do we receive this gracious salvation which God offers? How can we be justified? Well, the answer is faith alone. All that is offered is by grace, a free gift, nothing we can obtain by merit or works. And it is obtained, received by faith. But even then, and don't miss this, even then faith, the very instrument by which we reach out and receive Christ and receive all that Christ gives, 
that also is a gracious gift from God. It's not a work of our own fallen, unregenerate hearts. Man does not have free will to simply believe. He's dead. Paul says, Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And what is it? It is grace and faith. Amen. Not one or the other, both. Meaning, according to Pauline theology, which is Reformed theology, faith itself is a gracious gift from God, and apart from this free gift of God, we would perish not receiving his salvation. And in case we have any doubts that faith is a gift given to us by God in order that we might receive his gracious salvation, consider Philippians 1.29. Paul says, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe, but also suffer for his sake. It's the same words in verb form. It has been granted to you or it has been gifted to you. That for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe, have faith, meaning it's been granted. That belief, that faith has been granted, given as a gift. Even the instrument by which we receive the gracious gift of God is in itself a gracious gift of God. And the Reformed have restored this and protected it, and it has been locked down in a confessional standard that I hope we adopt as a church. Westminster Shorter, question and answer 30. How does the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? Answer. The Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us. And thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. Therefore, where does faith come from according to the Scriptures and according to Shorter 30? Faith comes from the Spirit who works that faith in us graciously. And we can say the same about repentance, which is the flip side of faith, according to Acts 11.18 and 2 Timothy 2.25. Therefore, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, the sole instrument, teaches us that our part in salvation or justification is a receiving. And it is a receiving by the Spirit. Faith alone is by necessity a confession that we are poor and unworthy sinners who only deserve wrath and curse and therefore have nothing to offer God except the very sin that he hates. This is why Luther called himself a mere beggar. Our works are sinful and unrighteous and therefore all that we can bring is our torn and tattered garments receiving all that he offers by a humble faith that he himself has worked in us by his spirit so that we have absolutely nothing to boast in except the Lord himself and all that he has graciously given and worked within us. And Paul bangs this drum over and over and over again. Romans 3, 23 through 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Romans 3, 27 and 28. Then what becomes of our boasting, Arminians? It is excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we hold that no one is justified by faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works, without works of the law. Or Galatians 2, 15 and 16. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus 
in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, but because, because by works of the law no one will be justified. Is he clear? Very. Crystal. Crystal clear. So here's the bottom line. Justification, which is a judicial declaration from God as judge in heaven, in which he declares us righteous, positively, and forgiven. It comes by faith alone, faith apart from works. Whereas Rome was mixing justification and sanctification, denying imputed righteousness and teaching infused righteousness. Therefore, to deny justification by grace alone through spirit-wrought faith alone is to preach another gospel. And this is what Luther began to see. This is what Calvin saw. This is what the reformers saw. This is why they called the Pope the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church the Whore of Babylon. Whereas the Roman Catholic Church wanted to anathematize Luther and the reformers, the reformers saw them as just as much anathematized in many places in their doctrine. But now, we need to see that this spirit-wrought faith, which is a gift of grace, and the justification, the declaration that we are right before God, righteous and forgiven, those two pieces, we need to see that this gracious reality by faith is exclusively tied to Christ and no one else. Nothing else. Christ alone. Solus Christus. Meaning the merits of the saints and Mary as mediatrix. Indulgences. All of it is not only unbiblical, but it is irrelevant. According to the Reformed. The biblical teaching recovered during the Reformation teaches that there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. There is only one name under heaven by which we must be saved, and there is only one way to the Father, and that is Christ alone. And it has been that way since Genesis 3.15. It is only in Christ that we receive all that we need for justification and salvation. It is only by being united to him by faith which the Spirit works in us after we have been called and regenerated. Meaning if justification requires two elements, a positive one and a negative one, if we want to talk that way, or one passive and one active, a positive righteousness and a payment for our sin that we might be forgiven, what the reformers were teaching is that according to the scriptures, the only place that those two realities can be found is in Christ. Regarding the positive element, the righteousness that must be present, a perfect obedience to God's law, which is righteousness, that is found only in Jesus Christ and his active obedience. He is the righteous one. He is the one who came perfectly fulfilling every jot and tittle of God's law, the very law that Adam broke in the garden. Therefore, in his life of perfect and exact obedience, he has the righteousness of God. He has the very righteousness that we need if we are to stand before God as righteous. And this righteousness which we might call an alien righteousness because it's not ours, the righteousness of Christ obtained in his act of obedience, it becomes ours, it is accounted as ours or imputed by faith. And this is why in the fullness of time, Galatians 4.4, Christ was born under the law. But not only did he positively obey the law of God, in his act of obedience, but he came in the fullness of time under the law that he might undergo the wrath and curse of God as a result of breaking that law. 
bearing the wrath and curse that we deserve on the cross in order that we might not just be positively as accounted as righteous, but forgiven because of the guilt of sin. In order that our sins might be forgiven so that we ourselves will not have to suffer for them for eternity in the lake of fire. And these two realities, his active and opassive obedience, which is really just one obedience, they collide in Philippians 2a, where Paul says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, there's the obedience, to the point of death, even death on a cross. And thus, because of the need for active obedience and passive obedience, an active alien righteousness which is given to us, and our sins taken away in his standing in our place as penal substitute. Because of those two things, this is why Machen, on his deathbed, sent a note to John Murray saying, so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. And then he dies. This is something that the Reformed teach that in many cases mere evangelicalism doesn't teach. Mere evangelicals simply focus on his suffering, simply focus on his death on the cross, simply focus on all of those aspects. When the Reformed have been utterly dogmatic in in preaching and protecting not only the passive obedience in his suffering, but the active obedience of Christ, his righteousness in accordance with God's law, which is imputed to us by faith. Therefore, salvation, or justification most precisely, is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, And therefore, how blasphemous is it to teach or believe that we need someone or something else besides him? To teach that he is insufficient or not enough in his own person. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, incarnate the God-man forever, we have all that we need for eternal life and salvation in all of its parts. And all that he accomplished all that he secured, it is freely or graciously given to us, and it is received by a graciously given spirit, rod, faith, and thus salvation belongs to the Lord. Summarizing all of this, John Murray, in Collected Works 1, page 304, says, central to the issue that raised the banner in 1517, and central to the issue with Rome still, is the gospel of a full, perfect, and irrevocable justification by free gift through faith in Jesus Christ on the basis of a righteousness undefiled and undefilable, a righteousness in which omniscience finds no blemish, a righteousness of God, the righteousness of him who fulfills or fulfilled all righteousness and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that, brothers and sisters, is the biblical gospel. And that is what the Reformation was about. And this is a hill upon which the church has been willing and must be willing forever to die. You must be willing to die to protect these doctrines. But now, on what authority does this gospel of justification by grace through faith in Christ all alone rest? Well, the answer, according to the reformers in opposition to Rome, was sola scriptura. Meaning, the reformers were returning to the word of God as final and most ultimate authority by which all teaching and tradition, written and oral, must be compared and tested. Meaning the scriptures are the fire through which all things must pass. This was not true of Rome. 
which taught that the oral tradition passed down was equal in authority to the written revelation of God. But the scriptures will not allow us this. The only infallible source of truth upon which we must stand as the church of Jesus Christ is the word of God and not the traditions of men. It is only the scriptures, according to Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16, which are God-breathed and none other. In fact, scripture gives us examples of men living according to their traditions in the name of God, which actually contradict the word of God. Matthew 15, 1 through 3. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And this is what Jesus says. And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Therefore, the reformers were aiming to break free from this reality. And therefore, it was a return to Scripture alone as final, most ultimate, infallible authority. But there's a danger here. And the danger, which has happened over and over and over again in the church in different areas of doctrine, is an overcorrection. Meaning an overcorrection that leads us into anti-creed, anti-confession, or anti-traditional territory. And that also is wrong. The reformers wanted to simply recover the idea that all traditions and all teaching and all authority, whether in the creeds or the confessions or even in preaching, it is an authority that is always derivative of Scripture, never in competition with it. Meaning all the creeds and confessions, all agreed upon teachings, which we can call a tradition, they are all subservient to and in submission to and must arise from the biblical text, thus making the Bible supreme. And the Westminster Confession, which is a biblical summary of the Christian faith, teaches this very thing. Chapter 1, paragraph 10 says, The supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined and all decrees of councils, including the Westminster, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits, are to be examined, and in whose sentence we are to rest, can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in the Scripture. That is sola scriptura. Therefore, this means that the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, Chalcedon, the three forms of unity, the Dutch Reformed, the Westminster Standards, and all other, other traditions are not the supreme judge, and they are not the final infallible authority. But instead, they are only as authoritative as they are biblical. But where they are biblical, they are authoritative. And therefore, we should be very slow to go against our reformed and confessional tradition. We might say with Gerhardus Voss and others that the reformed confessions are normed norms. They are the normal teaching of the church which have been normed by what? The norming norm which is the word of God. It is the word of God, which is the final and infallible authority, not the words of men. But now, and final, the fifth sola, why for all of these things? What is the purpose of everything? The five solas, or the four solas that preceded it? What is the purpose of the Reformation? What is the purpose of God and what should be the purpose of men and all things? And the answer, according to the reformers, was soli deo gloria. The glory of God alone. If we could summarize what reformed theology is at its very core, 
as opposed to other types of theology. It is the deep desire and aim in all things and at all times to glorify God. And that is as ultimate as you can get. It is a theology in which a banner is raised over and above all other things and written on that banner is this, that the absolute triune God himself is creator, redeemer, and consummator all unto his glory. It is the battle cry of the saints, saying that God wills and acts and accomplishes all things in history and before history for his own glory and for the sake of his own name. And therefore, the battle cry of the Reformed is the battle cry of Paul in Romans eleven thirty six. For from him, that is the triune God, and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. 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 That is the battle cry of the Reformed. A love and a defense of the supremacy of the glory of God in all things and in every doctrine. The glory of his eternality. The glory of his utter independence, or what we call in dogmatic theology, his aseity. The glory of his absolute sovereignty and providence. The glory of his eternal creed in which he has predestined all things without exception. The glory of his creating and the glory of his redeeming in and through his son. The glory of his sovereign saving by the work of the spirit who calls us effectually, regenerates and works faith in those whom he has chosen. And therefore, we despise any theology that would focus on man and his power and his will, which results in a casting down of a shadow over the glory of God in all that he wills and accomplishes. The question for the Reformed is not how is man saved. The question of the Reformed is not preeminently what is the Ordo Salutis. The question for the Reformed is most fundamentally and most ultimately, how is God glorified? And whatever the answers are, let them be what they are. If God is glorified in forming vessels of wrath, then the Reformed teach that God in eternity past has predestined vessels of wrath unto destruction for his own glory, because that's what we care about. But if the chief aim and end of God is God, and his own glory, and his own beatitude, his own benediction, then that end and aim should be the same for his people. This is why Westminster Shorter opens the way it does. Question and answer one that everyone in this room and all of our kids should know. And if you know it, say it with me. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. This is how the Westminster Shorter opens. What is the chief end of man? The glory of God and enjoying that glory forever. And what is this other than the image bearers of God in God's world reflecting the very aim of God himself who aims to glorify himself on all things? But understand this, that imaging forth God as those whose chief end is to glorify him, it is no mere duty. But we're, we were created to love and enjoy that same glory. That is the deeper Protestant conception. In fact, that heavenly glory is what we were created to know and see. God himself was to be and is to be our blessedness and reward. Confession 7.1 The glory of God which inhabits the highest heavens, existing there that we might enter into it and know it and see it and enjoy it forever, there and in the heavenized world. 
And all of this is impossible for those who are dead in their sin. Which is why we need regeneration and justification and salvation and all that God offers by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we could go on and on. We could have preached a series on each one of these souls. But my hope as we close, as we begin to close, is that this message will have awakened in you a new desire to study and plumb the depths of Reformed theology, especially the Westminster Standards, and the Reformation, understanding that the five solas are simply a summary and not by any means exhaustive. It is one of the most important movements in all of Christian history, which in my estimation and the Reformed estimation is simply a return to biblical Christianity. As put forth in scripture and summarized for us in the Westminster, a summary of Reformed and Presbyterian theology. And this is what the Reformers themselves understood to be happening. So when we speak about the Reformation and when we speak about Reformed theology and Calvin and all the others, what we mean is biblical Christianity, a biblical gospel. A God-centered, Christ-exalting religion in which God is all in all. A big God theology which teaches that God as immutable condescends and freely gives wicked beggars all that we need to know him forever. That he might be our God and we his people, the very heart of Reformed Covenant theology. And so may we as the church militant, as humble warriors, defend these glorious truths unto death, because even in death we win, because we will see him face to face. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God had three in one. We praise you for your grace. We praise you for the spirit wrought faith that you have worked in us and the repentance you have granted. We praise you for Jesus Christ and all that he is for us as his people. We praise you for your word. And we praise you that you have revealed to us your glory for your own glory, that we might know and enjoy that glory forever. Lord, we are nothing more than totally depraved beggars whom you have reached down and fed. Feed us, Lord, continuously with the bread of life that does not perish but leads unto everlasting life. Praise you for all that you've done in our lives and are doing and will continue to do until you bring us into the place of the beatific vision in which we see you and the face of Jesus Christ forever. Pray this all in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.